What's up guys, back with another educational video. And this week we're talking about a new study on time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. And it also dives into chrononutrition. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. I'm not the algorithm, but you know what I mean. So this week, new study came out, meta-analysis, looking at time-restricted eating and its effects on uh, HbA1c, HOMA IR, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and a few other things. What's interesting about this study in comparison to some other meta-analysis is they weren't like equating calories, they weren't doing any of that stuff, but they were just looking at does time-restricted eating have these effects compared to, I guess, whatever control diet that the people were on, but does the time that they do the time-restricted eating have an effect? What I mean by that is there's early time-restricted eating and there's late time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding, they call it. So early time-restricted feeding, they put in the window between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. So an eight-hour feeding window between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. and threw all the studies in from that. And late time-restricted feeding, I believe, was a feeding window from afternoon till 8 p.m. What did they find? Well, they didn't find a whole lot, really. When they did the overall meta-analysis, looking at all these time-restricted feeding studies, they did see a reduction in HbA1c, uh, but they did not see a change in fasting glucose or fasting insulin. That's not surprising. We know that time-restricted eating is a great way to restrict calories, and when you restrict calories and you lose weight, you do see improvements in HbA1c and HOMA IR, so these results aren't surprising. Now, what was a little bit surprising was when they looked at early time-restricted feeding versus late time-restricted feeding, and they did that subgroup analysis, they found that early time-restricted feeding was better for lowering fasting blood glucose, and it appeared to be a little bit better for lowering fasting blood insulin. So now a lot of people might say, hey, this shows that early time-restricted feeding, that's what you wanna do. It's better for glucose, it's better for insulin. I'm not sure if I actually buy that, and here is why. I don't think this is having a long-term effect because if it was having a long-term effect, we would expect that to show up in the HbA1c data. And HbA1c was not better for early time-restricted feeding versus late time-restricting feeding. Now, why is HbA1c important? Well, HbA1c is a site on hemoglobin, the molecule, that can become glycosylated. And since red blood cells take about 120 days to turn over, the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin you have is a really good indicator of your long-term blood glucose levels. Because the higher amount of blood glucose you have overall, the more glycosylated your hemoglobin is going to be. So why didn't they see differences in glycosylated hemoglobin if early time-restricted feeding is producing lower fasting glucose levels. My opinion, and again, I don't have empirical data to back this up, but I think it's a logical explanation. They are taking fasting measurements of blood glucose in the morning. If you are early time-restricted feeding and your final meal is at 4 p.m. versus late time-restricted feeding, where your last meal is at 8 p.m., you've had four hours extra to fast. It makes sense that in the following morning, your blood glucose levels would be a little bit lower than somebody who had eaten four hours after you. What I would like to see when they do some of these chrononutrition studies is actually stagger when they take the measurements. So if you're doing early time-restricted feeding, in my opinion, you should take that measurement four hours before you're doing the measurement for the late time-restricted feeding. Now, maybe I'm wrong, it's very possible I could be wrong, but to me, it just makes sense that if you're fasting for a little bit longer period of time, that you'd have a little bit lower blood glucose, and that also makes sense as to why the glycosylated hemoglobin wasn't different, because I would bet if we looked at the people who were doing early time-restricted feeding versus late time-restricted feeding, for example, where if we look at them at, say, 12 o'clock, people who have been doing late time-restricted feeding, their blood glucose is gonna be lower than the people who are doing early time-restricted feeding because people doing early time-restricted feeding have been eating. But I bet if we measured them under similar circumstances, apples to apples, based on how long they've been fasting, one hour post-absorptive, two hour, three hour, one hour fast, two hour fast, three hour fast, if we're measuring apples to apples, I bet there wouldn't be differences in blood glucose because if there were differences in blood glucose overall, we should see that show up in the glycosylated hemoglobin and we just don't see that. That being said, what's my takeaway? Well, my takeaway is if you like doing time-restricted feeding, it's a great way to restrict your calories, 
what I would personally recommend is to choose the feeding window that works for you when it comes to adherence. So if you're somebody who knows that you like to have a big breakfast, you need more food earlier in the day to feel more energetic and feel focused, great, do early time restricted feeding. You're not that hungry at night, no big deal. But if you're somebody who's like, you know, I really like to get home, have dinner with my family, enjoy a show, I like to have some food before I go to bed, then maybe late time restricted feeding is for you. But even these differences, these small differences, even if they were, let's say the fasting blood glucose is actually a legitimate difference. Even if it was a legitimate difference, it wasn't a big enough difference to where it should supersede adherence. So you should still do whatever makes the most sense for you based on adherence. All right guys, being able to read and disseminate studies and break this all down, just something as simple as like, hey, these folks probably had lower glucose because they were fasting longer. That's something that's really hard to pick up without a trained eye for research. That's why I created my research review reps. Every month we break down five studies in fitness and nutrition that are popular, that are getting a lot of headlines, and we break down why the researchers tested what they tested, how they tested it, the subjects they used, what they found, what it means for you, and how it fits with the overall body of the literature on the subject. And we give you our opinion as to whether or not we actually agree with the researchers' conclusions if we do disagree, we'll tell you. That is a great tool. It's written in very plain language, so it's not confusing, but we still do a great job of breaking down why the researchers found the results they found and what it means for you personally. So make sure you click the link in the description, sign up for that. When you sign up for reps, not only do you get the issue that we're on, but you get all archived issues and you get our guide how to read research about a 50 page ebook that we wrote on how you can get better at reading research studies yourself. So it's a great value. Make sure you click the link and check it out and I'll catch you guys next week.